Wynn Thomas, you're the production designer for Spike Lee's The Five Bloods uh, about Vietnam War vets who returned to the country uh, years later for some unfinished business. Uh, now you've collaborated with Spike Lee going all the way back to She's Got a Habit in 1986. Uh, well, but was this, kind, was this kind of story and this setting uh, kind of uncharted territory for your work together with him? Uh, yes, I mean, I think this is the first time I've gone overseas with Spike. And the subject matter was uh, an, an unusual subject matter for him. We've never, in my time with him, we've never dealt with the, uh, the Vietnam War. I know he did work on another war film uh, a couple, several years ago. But so it was an unusual uh, subject matter for us. And uh, it, um, it was a, a very interesting journey working in Thailand and Vietnam. Uh, and, and working on lo location uh, in Thailand and Vietnam, uh, like what was the process of, of you know, learning the locale and the environment and, and in order to, to develop the visual style of the movie? Well, we were very lucky that we had a local production company and we were work in, in Chiang Mai, Thailand, which is where we were uh, centered. And so that local production company provided us with local locations people which became a big part of my collaborative process because so much of the movie takes place in jungles. So, uh, so we had a local production company. I had a local location uh, manager. Each department, there was a department head. For each department head, there was someone from the United States and there was their local counterpart in either Thailand or in um, Vietnam. So it was a collaboration between um, American companies and the local uh, Thai or Vietnam uh, uh, production companies. Uh, was that a, a more uh, a complicated collaborative process than usual, or or was it was it fairly smooth uh, working with? Well, interestingly yeah. enough, it it was actually fairly smooth because, um, for example, I had my lo my art director from the United States was a gentleman named Jeremy Woozy, and then there was uh, uh, Siong, who was my art director in. Um, in uh, Thailand and he spoke very good English. So he was the go-between person who would uh, help us negotiate uh, with my department, with my carpenters, with my painters. He was the person who, was, who became essentially my voice because everybody else spoke Thai. So it was very, it was very interesting that way. And then, uh, and so there was that kind, in each department, there was that person who spoke English who was able to get over the, help us get over the, the language barriers. Uh, and, and how many, you know, sets uh, had to be uh, constructed for the film as opposed to uh, how much uh, locations were you scouting and using real locations? Well, I, you know, the movie, you know, much of the movie, as, as you know, takes place in the jungle. So part of my design challenge was how to sort of chart that journey through the jungle and how to make it visually interesting. So from a conceptual point of view, when you look at the film, uh, when you first see our character, when they first be, when our characters first begin their journey, there's a lot of open sky. There's a lot of big, huge vistas and dramatic vistas. But as Paul, as the film begins to get closer to its climax, and as Paul begins to lose his mind, you actually, what happens is, is I begin to eliminate the sky from the, the, the movie and the jungle begins to encroach upon that character. It almost, so the idea was from a conceptual point of view that as Paul is losing his mind, the jungle is, is entrapping him and, is, and enclosing him. So that became a, a, a conceptual uh, idea which I had to share with the locations department and which determined how we were going to approach looking for the jungle. I mean, I spent months in the jungle just walking around and trying to figure out where the scenes were going to take place. And the other consideration, of course, was where we we're going to park the cars for the crew. Um, so there was the whole jungle aspect of it. And then a lot of the interiors uh, we found, uh, for example, for DeRoche's home, there was an abandoned mansion right in the middle of downtown Chiang Mai. And essentially, we went in there and we sort of fixed that up we fixed that up essentially to work for the film. Um, then there were other, uh, there were other interiors for uh, even, well, there was the, uh, there was a, 
um, uh, the bar where they, the kids kind of get to meet together for the very first time. And that was, again, a location that was in Chiang Mai that was not in great shape. So I had to come in there and sort of fix it up and make it look like something. Uh, then there was Tien's apartment, which is again, was an abandoned apartment in an, in a lovely high rise in Chiang Mai. And we literally came in and just fixed up the space to reflect who uh, Tien was and to uh, um, give the film, you know, Tien's character is a, we're not quite sure who she is. We're not sure if she's a good guy. We're not sure if she's a bad guy. And if you look at both, Tien's apartment and DeRoche's apartment, there's a lot of gold in both spaces. And the whole idea, because this movie all is about who's going to get the gold. It's all about the gold. Much of this movie is all about the gold. So in Tien's apartment, I made it all about red and gold and black because I kind of wanted to, to plant the idea in the viewer's mind that this is someone who likes gold. And the same thing for DeRoche. DeRoche's character was cooler and bluer, but still there are a lot of accents of gold in his space as well, because both these characters, we don't know if they're good or bad, but we, I wanted to plant the seed in the audience that they do like gold. So all of those kinds of accents are in their living spaces and their workspaces. Uh, and finally, for the, the big set that we built was the, the ruins at the end of the film. The, uh, my design is based on a, a temple in central Vietnam called the Misan Temple. And obviously we could not shoot there. So I had to create my own version of the ruins in a jungle in Chiang Mai. So uh, we, uh, what happened was, is as, I, as we were scouting locations around Chiang Mai, I kept seeing these sort of square rectangular, tall rectangular buildings. And it turns out that they were buildings that used to be used to dry tobacco leaves. And so I said to my locations department, it would be great if we can find a space that had a couple of these buildings and then I could build the buildings that I needed in, in, in combination with these other structures. Because the, the, the original Misan ruins is it's huge, it's enormous. And I knew that I could not build the, the entirety of it, but I needed to build a portion of it. So what happened was is that my locations department found all a couple of these cylinders in a stretch of jungle that was behind a suburban shopping mall. You would never know it. So this, this, this stretch of jungle was about two football fields. And in the middle of this, of this, this stretch of jungle were a handful of these uh, tobacco leaf drying brick structures. And at that point, I was able to sort of figure out that I could plant, I could design the structures that I needed to work for the film and, and, and create the, this uh, uh, ancient ruins in the middle of, uh, a, a sub, behind a suburban Chiang Mai street. I <laughs> would never know that. So, so we, I had a crew of amazing Thai artists and sculptors and painters and that sh those ruins were, my structures were built out of wood and styrofoam and uh, the, uh, the painters, uh, the, the, the sculpting work was amazing on the film. And, uh, and then the painters came in and they painted it to look like the, uh, the Misan ruins. And the work was so good that you could, people could have thought, most people thought that these ruins had been there for centuries. They had no idea that it was a set. And the other thing is that people would walk up to the walls and they would stand right next to the walls and they would think it was stone, not realizing that all those sculptures were made out of styrofoam. So I think we uh, managed to trick the audience. Uh, and, and, you know, you mentioned a little bit right before we started recording about how shooting outdoors uh, uh, for a production designer can be, uh, shall we say, complicated. Uh, was you know, did, did the elements present uh, any any particular unique challenges? Well, you know, uh, for this film? You know, ironically, we were we were actually shooting in Chiang Mai probably at the worst time uh, because it was we were shooting there essentially what what is their summer, and so it was extremely hot. 
we were working and uh, the weather would sometimes, the temperature would sometimes get up to 105 degrees. And then um, the other part of it was, is that it was the time of year where the farmers in, in Chiang Mai begin to burn their fields. So we had a combination of, feet, of heat and, and sort of toxic air from all the fields being burned. And it was a big problem for us because you know, a lot of the vistas that I chose, when I scouted them initially in January, they were completely clear and beautiful blue skies. And then when we started to shoot, we had a big problem because a lot of them were covered with layers of smoke. So we didn't quite get the dramatic vistas that we had intended to get. Uh, and then the other problem was, you know, actors working out in 105 degrees every single day is a problem. So uh, we had to do everything we could to protect the actors and the crew. We would have, they set up all these portable tents with air conditioning units, but it was still, uh, it, was, it was problematic. Um, we actually had to change uh, the, the, the uh, this is an inside story. Uh, when Paul's character originally that last, his last moments were conceived, I had found a location in, in the middle of a jungle deep in the jungle where it was almost like a bamboo th cathedral because the whole idea was that the, the, he was being crushed by the jungle. And we wanted to shoot that scene and Spike fell in love with this location, the DP fell in love with this location, but it was very difficult to get to. It was literally walking through the jungle for about 20 minutes with all the camera crew and all the equipment. And so what happened on the day that we were supposed to shoot that sequence it was very, very hot. And it was really very difficult for the actors to make that journey and for the crew to make that journey to this destination, which was a half hour into the jungles. So we actually shot the final sequences for Paul in a, in a, in a jungle that was closer to the parking lot uh, for the film. But in many ways, for, for me as a designer, it was very disappointing because it became almost like, a, you know, that moment is almost a religious moment for Paul. In fact, Spike kept referring to this location as the Bamboo Cathedral. And it was just a visual moment that we had to let go of because of the weather and because of logistics. Uh, another big part of the story uh, involves uh, the crashed plane where the bloods find the gold. Uh, what was the process of, of designing and, and building that location and, and, that, and that set? Well, interesting enough, the, the crash site location we actually use twice. We use it in the contemporary sequences and then we use it for the flashbacks. So part of my challenge was to make sure that the looks were a little different for, for both time periods. So for the contemporary sequence, we use the, the valley as in, for what it was. We didn't change very much, but for the flashback sequences, we had to make it look like it was a slightly different place. So literally we, we are, I had a, in a very good greens department who would go out and hire local people from the local villages to come in and plant all these palm trees. So we literally planted thousands of palm trees for that crash site sequence. And then we, uh, we built the plane itself in the shop, in our state shop. That was, all, and then we found a couple of uh, like the heads of the plane and a couple of wings. we found all that stuff. And so we used our built scenery and then our found pieces to create that crash site. But it was quite an extensive job because I mean, literally I have memories of going there just to check to see how the work was going on. And I would see families from the local Thai villages all out there planting these trees and their kids would be there and their, you know, their husbands and wives, all of these folks who were there helping us with achieve the look of this movie. And I'm, extremely grateful for all the work that they did. Now, Defy Bloods has been uh, an awards contender this season. Um, and, uh, you know, you know, for everyone's work on the film, including your own, hope, uh, fingers crossed. Um, and you actually uh, uh, won your uh, very first uh, Art Directors Guild Award uh, uh, fairly recently in, in 2016 for Hidden Figures. Uh, what, what did that mean to you to get that recognition from your peers, especially, you know, with, with the body of work that you accumulated? Yeah, over well, you know, I, you know, it's, look, I, I, you know, it's been a complicated emotional process for me because, you know, I've been doing this for a long time. So it's taken a long time for, 
uh, my community to sort of see the work, I think. Um, so I was very grateful to get the award for uh, Hidden Figures. And I think, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, the awards process is a very complicated process. There are many factors at play. And, you know, obviously the primary factor is that the work has to be good. But there are also, as we know, there are many other elements that have to fall into place in order for that recognition to happen. Um, so uh, I'm keeping my fingers crossed this year. But again, I think what's, you know, I think the thing about my work is that it really, and this is what we're supposed to do. My work serves the story. So very often you don't see it. And again, I think it's very much like the response that people who, who had to the, the ruins that we built. They walked out into that jungle, they walked out into that space, and they thought that those ruins had been there forever. And most people, when I talk to them about the film, think that, well, we went to some existing place. So therefore, what happens is I'm, service, I'm doing what my job is, which is to service the story and to tell the story and not draw attention to the scenery. And as a result of that, sometimes I think the voters don't see the work. So that might explain, that might explain, uh, I, I hope, I hope, and I hope that I'm doing that on everything that I do. So that might explain uh, why there hasn't been much uh, recognition from the awards committees. Uh, well, I, I agree that, uh, the, you know, the work is invisible in the sense that I believed every set and every scene in the film. Uh, so congratulations on that. Uh, and I want to congratulate you on the film as a whole, uh, you know, and, you know, the acclaim it's received, uh, the recognition it's getting. Uh, and, and thank you so much for, for talking with me today. It's been a pleasure. Oh, oh great. Oh, thank you much. Thank you for, for it's been, uh, I've been, uh, it's been terrific to, to see you and to see the Bronx in the back. <laughs> and uh, thank you very much for your time, man. It's been great.